start the session in the second, in the second day. Uh, uh, this uh, second day will be open with uh, uh, the second uh, lecture. Uh, my co-chairman is Dr. Jose Luis Ferreiro from the Belvice University Hospital. And uh, this second uh, lecture is entitled Research in Antithrombotic Agents. Uh, what, uh, what is in the pipeline? The lecture will be given by Dr. Uh, Lina Badimon. Uh, Dr. Badimon is the director of the Cardiovascular Research Center in Barcelona, in the Hospital Santa Creu in San Pau, uh, from the Autonomous uh, University of Barcelona. Lina, please. So good morning, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for the invitation. And ladies and gentlemen, it's for me a pleasure to be here with you today. The topic I was given. Next. Is, can you start? Now. So is, uh, what's going on now in the pipeline for new antithrombotic drugs? Um, this is the, uh, the status of the situation at present. We, uh, until now, have been working in understanding platelet function and um, different drugs were developed. And presently, uh, the, uh, the state of the art is on ADP receptor antagonists and aspirin, mainly, as the main uh, uh, drugs in uh, dual antiplatelet therapy. And uh, in the area of coagulation, we have these direct uh, 10A inhibitors that have been uh, used mainly in atrial fibrillation, but also recently the COMPASS trial was trying to understand if they could be useful also in the arterial system. Therefore, this is what we have, but what is in the pipeline, what's new? We could say that at present, we have also many studies that are trying to deal with changing regimes on anticoagulants versus antiplatelet drugs. And if we, we consider the arterial system or when we introduce a patient that has atrial fibrillation and in addition has coronary disease, the, uh, the use of different uh, drugs is really more complicated. And the, there are trials now trying to understand how to reduce dosages to avoid the main problem that we have in this area, that is bleeding. So the balance between safety and efficacy is what is being pursued in these new developments that are going to reach, we hope, the clinical arena in the next years. So what, what are the novelties we have in the pipeline? So here is a slide that I think tries to resume very clearly what is being done what is being done at the level of different targets within the platelet. So something that was never approached before, and it's being analyzed to reduce the bleeding uh, problem with uh, the, the antiplatelet drugs we have at present, is to target phospholipase in ositol 3-phosphate. This PI3 uh, kinase isoform beta um, has been pursued because it's a central part of what's happening with platelets that are activated are uh, being approached by different companies and there are uh, some that are at the preclinical phase and there is one that is in uh, phase one. Obviously, these are mainly intravenous, although there is one that also is being investigated preclinically in oral dose. What is PCS, uh, what is the, the PI3 kinase? PI3 kinase is in the middle, oh, yeah. Here is PA3 kinase, is in the middle of signaling of all the activation of platelets coming from ADP, from thromboxane, from collagen, even from thrombin, not activation coming from addition molecules or von Willebrand factor, but the, the main targets for platelet aggregation signal through PA3 kinase. Therefore, it's logical that now there are these options of looking into blocking this activation. If we simplify the platelet, the, here is where we are. We have the, the PK3 uh, beta, and these three drugs, only one, that is the one with the asteriscus, is the one that is in phase one. The other two are preclinical. Second group, um, a new target is the protein disulfide isomerase, 
and GP2B3A. So there is still the GP2B3A receptor was the target, as you well know, of a lot of research uh, 15, 20 years ago, and the chronic use of these blockers could not be used. Now is they are being used in the, in the cath lab in some patients, but there is a lot of research still trying to block the activation of GP2B3A. So PDI, uh, protein dissociative isomeras, is a protein that is in the uh, endoplasmic reticulum of many cells. And also platelets have this, uh, this uh, endoplasmic reticulum. It's a leftover from the side. But when you block this uh, protein, there is some inhibition of platelet activation. Let's say that the research that is being done in this isocoercetin that is in phase two, three, and is being used orally, is in thrombosis associated to cancer. That's what is done until the present time, but the objective is also to have information on CAD, PAD, and cerebrovascular disease. And in regarding the GB2B3A, the uh, there are molecules that are trying to block the high affinity state. You know that this 2B3A receptor is, uh, is, is low affinity or high affinity. So molecules are trying to block this path from low affinity to high affinity. Other molecules are trying to inhibit the signaling, the outside in signaling. And if we go to our diagram to make it easier, this is the area where this uh, is being analyzed. We have these um, small molecules that are going to be blocking the, the, the high affinity uh, GP2B3A, and these uh, uh, PDI inhibitors that are going to be also working through GP2B3A and are going to block the activation of the receptor. In addition, the, this small molecule is going to uh, uh, approach the inhibition of signaling. So how these <coughs> 2B3A receptor signals to produce further signalings to expose other receptors. In here, we uh, are uh, with, as I say, isocoercetin is in phase one, two clinical trial. The other ones are preclinical yet. <clears throat> the next le level of inhibition is with uh, research done to block the thrombin receptor. <clears throat> thrombin receptor, we have Arupaxar. You are very well aware that it was, uh, it reached the clinical arena late, and although it was claimed that it was going uh, to be inert in terms of bleeding, it didn't happen and it produced some bleeding. But research didn't, did not stop, and uh, there is now, uh, there are two targets, let's say. One is PAR1 and the other is PAR4. There are two different types of thrombin receptor in the platelet. PAR1 uh, is being analyzed trying to block paramodulins that are co-receptors of the, of, the, of the thrombin receptor, and PC128 that is blocks the intracellular signaling. As you see, many new drugs are going to approach the intracellular signaling, trying to, not blocking the receptor in the outside because it produces bleeding, but trying to uh, abort the activation of the platelet. How this receptor in the membrane is able to signal so that the platelet can avoid exposing other receptors and contributing more to aggregation. Uh, the, uh, there are, in different phases of development, uh, there are preclinical molecules in both in part one and part two and part four antagonists, and there are also two that are already in phase one or phase uh, two. And if we go back to our model, simplify model, we see that we are talking about PAR. It is, is this area here, the, the receptor. Uh, paramodulins will block the external pathway of thrombin activation of, of PAR1. And internally, we have this inhibitor of signaling that is in phase one of clinical development. Now this is PAR4, and PAR4 has a significant amount of research trying to block. Uh, we have one, the first one that is in phase two, three, and this is given orally, that many of these molecules that are going to block signaling are intravenous, and that will be a problem in when we uh, have to treat patients, but this one is already being developed as an oral uh, drug. There is another one that is blocking intracellular signaling. The next group is GP6. GP6 is the receptor for collagen, and it has been a target of a lot of research in the last years. The molecule that is more advanced is Rebacept. Rebacept inhibits the interaction of, of the receptor with collagen by blocking specific epitopes in collagen. This is in phase two, 
And in reality, this is po possibly one of the molecules that is more developed. Although in my view, it has taken so long since the, the discovery of the molecule to the phase two that is suspicious in some way. Because this, uh, this, this Rebacep molecule is around for some, some time. In addition, there are uh, other molecules that are in phase one, like the, uh, the, a blocker of the activation of GP6, and then two more that are really preclinical, and uh, the, the development will be a little bit slower. Here is the, the area of the collagen receptor. Collagen is in the, in the vessel wall. Uh, the, the collagen is recognized by GP6. These molecules block <coughs> the interaction, and then other molecules are trying to, again, inhibit the signaling from the receptor to the activation of the platelet at further exposure of receptors. We go to von Willebrand factor. We are going down in the scale. Von Willebrand factor is a molecule that is also in the vessel wall that when uh, blood circulates at high shear rate is able to uh, form complexes with the axis GP1B9 uh, and 5. These uh, uh, receptors that are ubiquitous in the, in the, in the, in the platelet membrane. is the second most frequent receptor. The first is the 2B3A. A platelet has 80,000 GP2B3A receptors and 15,000 GP1B receptors. So it was logically a target. But it happens the same as with, uh, with the collagen receptor. Von Willebrand factor axis has been there for many years, and all the initiatives uh, didn't have success because of bleeding. And the same has happened here, because these molecules that are in phase two, um, two of them has, have been halted. So they will never pass to phase three because they produce bleeding as the predecessors. So this is the von Willebrand factor here. Von Willebrand factor is in the vessel wall. And these two, this was, this reach, uh, the, the couple of Cisumab reached phase two and has been halted. And uh, this other molecule, the same thing, because both of them produce significant bleeding. And this is understandable because you are blocking the, the recognition of platelets by the vessel that you don't want to block hemostasis. That's the point of, of when we treat that we are blocking thrombosis and also hemostasis. And this molecule that is in phase two is still moving, but really we, uh, the, the expectations are not very high because when we block this receptor, we have significant bleeding. And the last group is the P2Y12, P2Y1. Although we have strong drugs here and they are being used clinically, research in this area has not been stopped. At the contrary, there is a significant amount of work being done because uh, there are already uh, drugs uh, that are in phase two. They are uh, being used subcutaneously and uh, we have uh, some, some data already available. But the point, the new, the novelty is that not only P2Y12, the target of all the tianopiridines and, and ticagrelor is being looked to block it, but also the P2Y1. And here is an example of what uh, I'm talking about. So we have the, uh, the ADP receptor that you all know. The ADP recognizes P2Y12, and this is blocked by the drugs that are available and the, the drugs that were before, and also by this new one that is Celatogrel, that is uh, going to be used uh, uh, IV or subcutaneous, not oral, uh, that will be similar to what it was Cangrelor. They are going to block this pathway, but we knew for many years that ADP also recognized the P2Y1, and the P2Y1 is the one that initiate the activation of the platelet, the, 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 shape, uh, the change in shape, uh, produce transient platelet aggregation, to be followed by activation of this, uh, the, the P2Y12, the purin these are two purinergic receptors, to fulfill the complete platelet aggregation. So the idea was, if we can block this pathway of ADP-induced uh, platelet aggregation, we'll be diminishing the possibility of bleeding because we are changing uh, only the, plate, the, the shape of the plate, the platelet, and maybe we will not follow to block hemostasis. And these are new drugs uh, they have been moved that are being developed, and there is some hope that maybe in this area, this, these new drugs can reach the clinical arena. And this is the diagram. We, th we are here, we have a significant amount of, uh, of research. As I say, this uh, ACT is uh, Celatogrel, and there are others that are also uh, in development. Uh, the, uh, the, this is the mechanism you know better because it's the mechanism already used by uh, Ticagrelor, Prasugrel, and uh, uh, Clopidogrel. 
But there is another one that was, is not in the general diagram, and is the adenosine receptor. Adenosine has been with us for many years. It's important for not only for platelet inhibition, also for cardioprotection, for reducing inflammation. And the platelet has a lot of uh, adenosine receptors. There is new development in this area, and this is what is, uh, is, is happening. There is a, a compound that is a recombinant human apirase. What it does is that it uh, degrades uh, ATP to ADP to form adenosine, and this adenosine blocks all the uh, adenosine receptors. There is data already showing that this, uh, this compound produces inhibition of platelet aggregation, and uh, more data in experimental animal models in dogs uh, was, study, uh, was studied in the United States, showing that in addition of blocking platelets, also produces some cardioprotection. So what of these therapies I show you that many were preclinical are more advanced. This is a, a, a summary of those that are more advanced. The PC128 is, as I say, is a PAR1 uh, receptor inhibitor through the G protein, the intracytoplasmatic tail, and uh, there is a phase two being developed. It's called TRIP-PCI, and is already going. Celatogrel, that we have um, many friends are working on this, like uh, Rob Story and uh, Angelillo. Um, Celatogrel is in uh, phase two has been finished and, uh, and phase three is being planned. <coughs> this will be parenteral, as I said before, and blocks P2Y12. Bicagrel. Bicagrel is a Chinese molecule. It's similar to clopidogrel, has a small variation in the molecule to make it different, but it's like clopidogrel, with a, 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 me, a metabolism uh, that is a little bit different of uh, clopidogrel, so it doesn't require the three phases to, be, uh, to reach an active uh, uh, formula, but it's uh, blocking again P2Y12. Uh, a phase two trial is being developed. They are using Verify now to test this for me is, uh, is not the best, but nevertheless, uh, they are going to try to put this uh, forward. Uh, the possibility of producing bleeding is in this case as, as with uh, clopidogrel. Then uh, we jump on factor 10A that we'll, we'll discuss later on. We go to a P-selecting inhibitor that I didn't show you before, but I didn't show it because this is already phase two, but it has been halted because um, it blocks P-selecting. P-selecting is, is a, a, an addition molecule that is expressed in the, in the platelet. But the, in phase uh, two, they show that there was more myocardial infarction than expected, and therefore uh, this molecule is stopped. And finally, Revacept, as I said before, is the GP6. This is uh, Isar plaster is being developed, it's a phase two study, and the concept is if I block like an interaction with collagen, I'll have the possibility of reducing platelet, uh, platelet aggregation in, and not affecting bleeding time. Obviously, this is what is being looked for, but in reality, we don't know if it will be uh, really the case. Now we have stopped with our antiplatelets, but I was asked for antithrombotics. If we look into the new therapies for antithrombosis, we have to look into the coagulation pathway. The success in blocking uh, factor 10A uh, um, was significant. And uh, as I said in the introduction, we have uh, anti-10, this is the, the direct oral anticoagulants being used in atrial fibrillation patients every time more. Uh, they are safer possibly than uh, vitamin K antagonists. And also uh, because they have been already looked for in the, in the arterial side. This is understandable because when we have a thrombus in a coronary artery, we have a thrombus that is rich in fibrin. Indeed, in our group many years ago, we demonstrated that depending on the shear rate of the blood against the atherosclerotic plaque, we have a composition of a thrombus that is, is variable, and in many instances we have fibrin. Therefore, the results of COMPASS are, are really understandable, and more research will be developed in this area. But what's new? The big hit in this area is the blockade of factor uh, 11 and factor 12. 
So factor 11 and factor 12 are members of the intrinsic pathway. So if you remember the McFarlane uh, coagulation cascade, there is an intrinsic pathway that is activated. This was called contact activation of coagulation. There is an extrinsic pathway that depends on tissue factor. This is what is triggered by atherosclerotic plaque. And there is a common pathway that is linked at the level of factor 10, N, 10 and 10A. And therefore, there is the cascade follows to formation of, uh, of thrombin. Now, the novelties are in this intrinsic pathway that was not approached before. Why is that? Well, as you are very well aware, there is a black box warning against the use of uh, NOAX or DOAX in patients with mechanical, bulb, uh, mechanical valves. The reason is that it was a trial some years ago with, uh, uh, with the bigger tran that showed that it was, uh, there were a lot of strokes and it was really uh, declared that, it could, uh, that the anti tenase could not be used. But the rationale for the failure of the bigger trunk was clear. Because what happens when you have a mechanical uh, bulb, when you have any prosthesis, is that what is triggered is the intrinsic coagulation cascade, the contact activation. And the contact activation is not completely blocked by blocking 10A. Therefore, there was a need to look for factor blocking of factor 12, because it's the beginning of the activation of the contact. So this is what has happened, and we have a new molecule that is the CSL312, is a monoclonal antibody against factor 12A. Uh, it's, uh, it's been proved in, uh, in uh, preclinical analysis, and there is a phase one uh, clinical evaluation at present, and uh, the idea is to test a phase two. How does it work is here. So CL, uh, this molecule blocks factor 12, uh, and the activation of factor 12. You know that this, uh, the blockade at this high level of the coagulation cascade has, in addition, the benefit that it blocks calicre inactivation and the formation of radikinin. So the complement activation is also blocked. What happened is that this factor 12 is able to activate uh, factor 11 to, to 11A, then enter the common pathway and thrombin formation. In addition, when you, we have platelet activation that is common in, in, in thrombosis in, the, in both, in venous and also arterial thrombosis, what happens is the platelet releases polyphosphates and the combination, it has the ability to produce a loop effect and activate again the formation of thrombin and the activation of factor 12. Therefore, the blockade of factor 12 is possibly a good target to be able to use the, these drugs to block thrombosis in heart valves. Finally, the factor uh, 11. Factor 11 inhibitors have been a boom. In the, uh, since 2016, there are more than 50 pat patents that have been filed. So everybody is looking to have one molecule that is able to inhibit factor 11. There are small molecules, monoclonal antibodies, oligonucleotides, polypeptides. All the different approaches have been used to develop uh, molecules that inhibit factor, factor 10A. Uh, 11, sorry, and uh, these are in development in different uh, layers. Where is this working? This is factor 11. It's, as I say, sitting in the intrinsic pathway, but already going to the common pathway with the extrinsic and intrinsic pathway of coagulation. This factor 11 is going to, when it's activated, is going to activate factor 9, and factor 9 will activate factor 10, and follow in the pathway that we already know. So it's a little bit higher in the coagulation cascade than the blockade of uh, factor 10A, that is, those are the molecules we have available at the present. And why is going to be better? There are many reasons. Um, for example, uh, patients that have uh, mutations in factor uh, um, 11 don't bleed as much as uh, patients that have mutations in other uh, uh, coagulation factors. And the other reason is a mechanistic one, as is the, uh, defined here. Factor 11A uh, contributes to the amplification phase of blood coagulation rather to the initiation. And because factor 11, uh, 11A has been considered to mainly contribute to the pathological blood clothing and to play a relatively uh, minor role in hemostasis. And, uh, and this, these two concepts is considered that bleeding will be much less. Indeed, in experimental models with these different types of drugs that have been investigated, uh, there is less bleeding in the animals that are treated with these drugs than those that are treated with factor 10A inhibitors. 
This is the, the status of the situation, as I mentioned, antisense oligonucleotides, monoclonal antibodies, aptamers, and small molecules. Different laboratories are involved in the development of these compounds. The route of administration is diverse, intravenous, oral, subcutaneous. The, uh, the onset and offset of action is variable in the different molecules, but all of them are targeting the factor uh, 10A. Once the oligonucleotides at the level of synthesis, because the mRNA is blocked, others at the uh, level of activity. And the, the, those that have ongoing clinical trials are below. The majority are oligonucleotides, so the idea of blocking in the liver the synthesis of the factor. And uh, they are being tested, as you see here, mainly in venous thrombosis. So knee arthroplasty, hemodialysis, uh, arthroplasty uh, again. And the last one, that the small molecule is being already tested uh, to be able, if it's able, to block ischemic attacks or, or small strokes. So with this I finish. We have a future with many drugs, but not all of these drugs will reach the clinical arena because there are many problems from the discovery to the development to the clinical trial with so many patients needed that it's almost a problem to run these trials in the future. We have here discussed this uh, uh, right side, this platelets and fibrin, but patients with coronary disease have also inflammation and we have to control lipid and, and cholesterol. Many of these molecules are uh, at the level of phase one, the, the, the ones depicted here, but as I say, we'll see selatogrel, it seems that it's closer to being developed, bicagrel also because it's promoted in China, but the other ones need a lot of uh, research uh, still to pass to be used clinically. We have to change the way we do clinical trials. At the ESC, we are working on that. Uh, it's, a, it's a topic for another <laughs> discussion, but the idea is that if we have, uh, keep having trials that require 30, 25, 30,000 patients, or even 15,000 patients, we will have few drugs that reach the, uh, the clinical use. And we have to change the way we do clinical trials, and we have to change the paradigm, and the moment is now. Thank you very much for your attention. Th thank you very much, Lina, for this excellent update. Uh, now we have, uh, I think, uh, five minutes for questions or discussion. Is there any question from the audience? In relation with the novel antiplatelet agents and from a clinical point of view, what should we expect from these uh, novel agents? So what is the potential uh, clinical benefit in comparison with ticarelol, prasurel, or clopidorel? Yeah, the aim of many of these studies is to find a drug that either by itself or in association to will reduce bleeding. Bleeding is a problem we have. We have a significant amount of bleeding with the strategies that we have followed until now. And this is something we can change if we look into the signaling of the platelet. That's why these molecules that still are at the preclinical or phase one are trying to avoid the activation of the platelet. So the platelet gets a message, a receptor that we are blocking now receives the message, and then activates itself by signaling internal signaling. If we block the internal signaling, we can avoid the effect of the ligand receptor interaction. Depending on how much we block this effect, we will be able to block thrombosis, but not hemostasis. We, when we have a thrombus in an artery, what we want is to reduce the size. It's a little bit like the stents. The stents, what they, what they, the success, uh, uh, the very uh, uh, high success when they were introduced was that the, the channel of the vessel was maintained large and a lot of thrombus disappear. Not all. That's why we have inflammation and other problems. But in, in reality, what we want with drugs is to be able to reduce the thrombus to a small mural thrombi that can be organized. That's what they've been looked for. I didn't have time to explain to you what we do in our center. I didn't think it was pertinent because you wanted the pipeline. But we're doing the same. We're looking to heat shock proteins. And these heat shock proteins are other instruments that the cells have, and the platelets have it from the megakaryocyte, that help to inactivate the effect of the external activators. External activators will be there. IDP will be there. Because when a thrombus is formed, IDP is being released in the niche 
of the thrombus or the atherosclerotic plaque. But if we can avoid the, 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 the high activation that is going to occlude the vessel, we will be helping for avoiding, let's say, infarcts and not uh, having bleeding. And that's the objective. This is what is missing in this area. If we didn't have bleeding, we didn't need more research. This, the drugs we have could be enough to really protect the patient, but they don't. Also, if I am poorest, I mean, uh, we have also leftover residual risk with these drugs, with P2Y12 inhibitors and uh, aspirin. So there is a 10%, right, uh, of risk, residual risk. But we could go for it. But if we increase dosages to reduce this ischemic risk, then we have a lot of bleeding. And that's what I think is the target of research at present from many groups. I mean, in Spain, what happened is we don't have uh, venture capital. And <laughs> then when we do research, we have to look for people, and it's th it takes time. But we're, we're going to have a patent for, to, to, study, to study that with another, another version of what you saw, blocking signaling. Avoiding that all platelets ch ch change the shape and are able to go there and contribute to the growth of the thrombi. We have another question from Dr. Marin here. Congrats, uh, Lina, for the excellent talk. Uh, in regarding antiplatelet drugs, it's not uh, all protection about uh, clot or re uh, reduction of the bleeding risk. Uh, what is your opinion about the new drugs, about the, the protection of the vessel? Well, this is something that also is considered, and there are many more actions of platelets that um, if we have good new drugs, can, can, for example, inflammation. Platelets participate in inflammation. The P-selecting blocker was addressing more that, protection of the vessel and also protection against inflammation due to platelets. In there, the, um, my, my search in the literature was more for antiplatelets uh, for blocking thrombosis. It was the title I was given. But it's true that there is a world uh, investigating how platelets can also help to restore the, uh, the, the integrity of the vessel wall. Their research is not so developed. And also, I mean, in, in, uh, in, um, in many instances, you have, we have endothelial cells that are covering even the biggest atherosclerotic plaques. It was considered before that endothelium was not there. Endothelium is there. So I think that for stabilizing the endothelium, I will look for other approaches instead of platelets. Although platelets are important, but I will look for lipids, stabilization through uh, control of lipids and other strategies and inflammation. Okay. Thank you very much. That was an outstanding presentation, as always. Thank you, Lina. So let's My move pleasure. on in order to keep in time with the, with the program. Let's move with, uh, with a controversy between dual and triple antithrombotic therapy in AFib patients undergoing PCI. Thank you.